So today, hopefully this is recording. Yes, it is. Today we are looking at some different ways to calculate enthalpy. We're going to focus on enthalpy now when we get to coffee cup calorimetry and go away from saying Q. But we're still going to do a little work with Q before that. And so this is where we're starting today. Ways to calculate changes in enthalpy. Today we're going to look at using stoichiometry and calorimetry to find our heat of a reaction, and that's what we mean by enthalpy. Um, the flippy thing and the big mama equation are other ways that we can determine delta H, and we're going to look at those a little bit later in the unit. And then even later on, there's going to be some more ways. So because enthalpy is a state function, it doesn't matter how we get to the end, we can calculate the same number in, with numerous different, numerous different methods. So first, stoichiometry. You guys already know how to do this. This is super, super simple. It says, consider the combustion of propane. And it tells us the reaction. And then it says the heat of this reaction is negative 2221 kilojoules. What does the negative tell us? Correct. It's exothermic. So in actuality, that 2221 is a product. So what it means is whenever they give you the heat of a reaction as written, for every one mole of these and five mole of these and three moles of these and four moles of these, there's that much heat associated with it. So we're going to do stoichiometry treating this just like any other reactant or product. Um, so we start with the given. It says, assuming that all the heat comes from the combustion, calculate delta H in which five grams of propane is burned in excess oxygen. So we're going to start with our given. This is all we have, five grams of propane. So let's start a stoichiometry problem. What do I need next? Got to convert to moles of propane. So for every one mole, we have 44-ish grams. So my grams cancel. Now I know how many moles of propane. Now what I do is just treat it stoichiometrically related to all of these coefficients. So for every one mole of C3H8, I have 2221 kilojoules. I can include the negative right there or not. It doesn't matter. What matters is when you report your final answer, you report it as a negative because that tells us that whatever amount of heat we calculate is actually released. All right, so what do we get? So give me three sig fix. 252, 252 kilojoules, and it's negative. That's how much heat is associated with the combustion of 5 grams of propane. You see why it's less? How much how many grams of propane would we have to combust to get a full two 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 one kilojoules? Right. One mole of it, forty four grams. Okay, so this is not going to be a full mole of heat released. Got it? All right, let's go on to the next one. These are pretty easy. These are really, really easy. It says the enthalpy for the formation of Na two is shown below. So carefully look at it and look at all the coefficients, and that reaction is releasing 828 kilojoules. What is the amount of heat released when one mole of Na2O is, oh, is formed? Not 414. Negative 414. Don't just like 414. Remember I said yesterday, if you don't have that sign to me, you're not answering the question. Okay. So it is negative 414, and that has to do, again, with the ratio. If you want to actually show the work, start with the given of one mole of Na2O, and then utilize the stoichiometric relationship. For every two moles of Na2O, I'm giving off 828 kilojoules. So that is negative 414 kilojoules. Got it? Ooh, this next one, let's see if you can handle it. They give you that reaction, and they want to know the enthalpy of that reaction. Yep, wouldn't it just be the negative? Yep, this reaction is the reverse of that. So something that's endothermic, if you flip products and reactants, you're going to make it exothermic and vice versa. So this comes out to be negative 472 kilojoules. So... 
the manipulation of these equations is going to be really common. When we get to what I call the flippy thing, we'll be flipping it, multiplying it through, and you actually did this in pre-AP. I don't know if you guys remember, but you actually did that. So this one, the only thing that makes this one any different than the first is the fact you don't have an equation. So what do you want to do first? Write a balanced equation. So we have C2, and I am missing an important piece of information here. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm making this number up. For those of you at home, because there's a lot of band people that are missing today, um, I am making up this number. The delta H of this reaction is equal to negative 1275 kilojoules. Totally made that up. Just out of my head just now. All right. We're combusting this. So what are my products of combustion? CO2 and H2O. All right, so normally when you balance combustion, my suggestion is to balance your O's last. So I have two C's on the left. That means I need two C's on the right. I have six H's on the left. So if I put a three here, so how many O's does that give me? Seven. I know it looks like I have an odd number of O's, but see there's an O here. So that means I need six. So if I put a three here, I'm good to go. So there's my balanced equation. Now I know I am combusting just a gram of this. So I can do my stoichiometry, 1.00 grams of C2H5OH for every one mole, whoops, wrong way, for every 46 grams, I have one mole of propane, so my grams cancel. Now how do I get to it? Now I can jump on the mole bridge. I have one mole there. So for every one mole of the stuff, I have negative 1275 kilojoules. So how much heat is released? Twenty-six point seven. Okay. All good with stoic. That's one way to find our answers. So now let's look at the introduction to MCAT. Q equals MCAT. Hugely important equation across various subjects that you're going to be seeing in your lifetime, where Q is the amount of heat, and a lot of times you might even see it lowercase. Q is the amount of heat that's either released or absorbed. M is the mass of the whole solution. So if you are putting in two things, you need to total the mass together. So this is the total mass of solute and solvent. Delta T is the change in temperature. T final minus T initial. We'll talk about the unit here in a second. So you'll start the reaction before you actually do anything. It's going to have an initial temperature. Then you do what you're going to do, and then it has a final temperature. So you do the delta. Specific heat capacity is the amount of heat that it requires to raise a gram of a substance one degree Celsius. So who knows what has the highest specific heat in the whole wide world? Water does. Um, good thing, too, because in Texas, if you think about the exposure of the heat to water in our bodies and everything, we pretty much vaporize over time. So um, water has a really, really high specific heat. Metals have super low specific heat. Some lower than others have... And if you all baked a turkey or a meatloaf or something and you pulled the pan out of the oven and it's covered with aluminum foil, what have you noticed about your ability to touch different things? The aluminum what? It's not as hot, okay? The reason that is, when it was in the oven, those two things were the same temperature. But the, re the reason you can touch the aluminum so quickly is because of its specific heat. It has a much lower specific heat. So it heats up faster, but it also cools down faster. Okay? So specific heats are going to always be given to you, and normally you get a joule per gram degree Celsius. Sometimes they ask you to calculate what we call the molar heat capacity. What would be the difference? Guess. Instead of grams, you'd have moles there. Just know what it is. You don't commonly use it, but on occasion they'll ask for it. So all you do is you multiply by the molar mass to get the grams per mole. Okay? I mean the, the joules per mole. 
Now, let's talk about this temperature thing. Notice here it says temperature and degrees, and degrees Celsius due to that degrees Celsius. But remember, this is a delta, so it's a subtraction. If I'm on the degrees Celsius scale and my final temperature is 100 and my initial temperature is 0 Celsius, what's my delta T? 100, right? If I have that same set of data on the Kelvin scale, it would be 373 minus 273. So what would my delta T be? 100. So is it crucial that you convert it? No, but just know it's going to come out. It's, your units aren't going to cancel because of it. Again, the only reason you're allowed to do that is because of the whole delta thing. Okay? All right. So let's do a couple Q equals MCAT problems. How much heat must be added? What are they telling you there? That it's endo. So we better get an endo answer here. To change the temperature of 250 grams of water from 25 to 60. So Q equals MCAT. I'm solving for Q. My mass is 250 grams. Water specific heat is given to you on your AP equation sheet as well as the MCAT equation. You're going to have to know in physics. Um, and if you've already taken physics, you already know MCAT. But specific heat of water, which would, might be a good thing to have in your pocket, is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And this is water liquid, not water solid or water gas. I know water solid sounds weird, but that's ice. All right, temperature final minus temperature initial, 25. I'm going to go ahead and put a dot here to make that second zero significant in the 60. So we're just going to stick with two sig figs. Do I get an endo answer? Yeah, thankfully. My grams cancel. My degrees Celsius cancels because that's degrees Celsius, leaving me with joules. So what do I get? 3,700 joules. That's how much energy would be required to make that temperature change happen. 37,000? 37,000. That's how much temperature would be required to change that. Okay, number five. If 2.09 joules are required to change the temperature of 15 grams of mercury by one degree Celsius, calculate the specific heat of mercury. Q equals now, you know, you can try to figure out, are the joules being added? Are they subtracted? Yeah, it looks like they're being added. But I need you to remember that mass and specific heat are always going to be positive. Okay, so if you were to throw the ne negative joules in here, not thinking, and you get a specific heat that's negative, just know that the problem was you put in the joules wrong. Um, does anyone want to guess what, like, a negative specific heat, if that's possible, and what it would mean? What would a negative specific heat mean? Close. It can't retain heat. Close. Correct. If energy is removed, temperature increases. So if energy is added, temperature decreases. How cool would that be, like, in Texas, to, like, insulate your house? Think about covering your house in Texas with something with a negative specific heat. So as the sun hits it, what's happening to the house? cool down. And then in the winter it works too. Yeah, not possible, but how amazing would that be? That would be so badass. That would be so cool. And I just said ass on video. There you go, eighth period. That one was for you because they're all going to be, my whole eighth period is going to be pretty much gone today. All right. So looking at this, we are going to calculate the specific heat. Um, 15 grams. We're calculating C, and we're changing by degree. So 2.09 divided by 15, 0.139 joules per gram. And I am going to kind of be on, on you about units on this. Okay, I need units on there. All right. So if any of you ever invent something with a negative specific heat, I want you to remember me and name me in your Nobel Prize because you've basically solved energy crisis across the globe if that you can do that. So. Well, you never know. I don't think I'll ever see anyone get to zero Kelvin in my lifetime, but maybe. You never know. I don't think it's possible, but 
who knows? Maybe we can go in some time machine or something and or some time warp and I don't know. Anything's possible. You seen the movie Gravity? You know anything's possible. <laughs> All right. That was stressful though, wasn't it? Yeah. I liked it. I thought it was good. I was entertained. Isn't that the point? Like kind of at the edge of your seat wondering what's gonna happen. Even though at the end I really wanted to see what happened, like them interview her and I wanted more closure. Yeah, I know. I wanted to be like them be amazed that she made it back and her talk about the other guy. Huh? She lives. You think they're going to do a movie where they both, everybody just dies and they end it in there? Yeah. Well, there is actually a movie, I can't remember the name of it, of these two people that um, are on a boat on this, I don't know if it was in Mexico or what, where they were at, but they were taken out on this boat to do like snorkeling or deep sea. No, they were going uh, scuba diving. And the boat just left them. And they died. Like one got eaten by a shark. And it was like the whole time them like floating around, talking. Yeah, it was horrible. And I can't remember the name of it, but they both died. Made for a horrible film. So, no. She lives. I'm sorry I spoiled it for you. But a lot happens up there in space. Calculate. I wasted a lot of minutes on that. All right. Calculate the final temperature after 1575 joules of heat are removed from an 85-gram sample of ethyl alcohol originally at 23.5 degrees Celsius. So we're looking for Ts. So we're going to take that delta T and break it down. If you want to solve for delta T and then break it down, you can. I just like putting it in the equation. So. Um, 1575 joules of heat are removed. What does that mean the system is? XO. This is going to mess you up if you don't make that negative, unfortunately. Okay? Watch yourself. M is 85. C is 2.4. Temperature final, we're looking for. Temperature initial is... So you really need to pay attention to the sign on the joules and the final minus initial. All right, solve away, my friends, solve away. We got some fast calculators today. I like it. Gives me more time to tell stories. Is that right? Everyone else got that? A 28.4 gram sample of an unknown metal was heated to 100 degrees Celsius and plunged into 100 grams of water, initially at a temperature of 24.6. The final temperature of the mixture was 25.34. Calculate the specific heat of the metal. Don't let this freak you out. Here's what's going on. We have some ice cold water in there. Nice and cold. It's really not, not that cold. It's pretty much room temperature. We have some tepid water in this glass. And we're going to take a really, 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 really hot piece of metal and throw it in the glass. Someone described to me the heat transfer. The heat leaves the metal and the water absorbs it, right? So notice the temperature of the mixture at the end was 25.34. Can you wrap your heads around the fact that if that sits there, they're going to reach the same temperature, okay? So what can you tell me then the relationship between the heat lost by the metal and the heat gained by the water? They're equal. The heat lost by the metal makes that what type of reaction, exo or endo? Exo. So not only is the heat lost equal to gain, more importantly, it's equal and opposite. So you're going to have to make one of these cues negative. Do you have to make the correct one negative? I don't care, as long as one of them is opposite. And so this ends up being negative MCAT equals MCAT. And I'm just going to say that a lot. Negative, so negative MCAT equals MCAT. One of these is going to be equal and opposite. Since metal loses the heat, let's just con be consistent in this problem. We're going to put everything in the metal on this side, everything in the water on this side, and we're going to end up solving for the specific heat of the metal. So what is the mass of the metal? 28.4 grams. We're looking for the specific heat of the metal. The final temperature of the metal, which was the same as that of water, is 25.34 and the initial temperature of the metal is 110. All right, so that's our one side. Now let's look at the water. The water has initially 100 grams, and we're leaving that side positive. 
Um, specific heat is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And my TF is 25.34, and my TI is 24.60. How come, look at that, the metal changed like 70-something degrees and the water only changed a degree? Why is that? Nice. Water has a really, really, really high specific heat. It takes a lot of energy to change its temperature. All right, so what is my C? Give me quattro, uh, 100 grams here. We're going to make that three. Give me three six six. Zero point one four what? One two nine joules per gram degree Celsius. All right, and that kind of makes sense. It's got to be a low specific heat because it sure is changing temperature a lot compared to that of the water. So you good with MCAT equals negative MCAT? Okay, that's just heat being transferred from one object to another. Um, there's a lot of slides here. We're going to come back to these. I'm just really concerned about us getting in coffee cup calorimetry. These are practice problems, and again, we will come back to these, I promise. We're going to go to coffee cup calorimetry. So, all right. This is huge, huge. This is your only laboratory type thing that you're going to be dealing with in thermochemistry. It's the only one we're really capable of doing next to bomb calorimetry, which they threw out of the curriculum. So I'm not teaching you bomb calorimetry this year. Coffee cup calorimetry is literally using a coffee cup and a thermometer to find the heat of a reaction, to find the delta H. So we're going to use coffee cup calorimetry to find enthalpy. A couple of things you need to know, and we've already talked about this, specific heat capacity is our specific heat in joules per gram degree Celsius, while molar heat capacity is joules per mole degree Celsius. No big whoop. Okay? Got it? So now let's talk about how we do a coffee cup calorimetry experiment. You are going to have a coffee cup Preferably styrofoam. Why would we use styrofoam? Good, good insulator. So not what happens. Why is the insulator important? Heat. No, I'm not going to say no heat is lost, but less heat is lost. So more of it is appropriately directed to the thermometer, right? And we get a better, a better measurement of the change in temperature. You're going to put in your reactant, one of them, preferably the liquid one. Take its temperature. That gives the initial temperature, right? Mix them together, and something's going to happen on the thermometer. The temperature's either going to go up or it's going to go down. Then you're going to collect a final temperature. And that's all you really need to get your results, because to figure out how much heat went to the thermometer or was, um, if the temperature goes down, how much, how much heat the liquid lost measured by the thermometer, you're just going to use Q equals MC delta T, where Q is what you're calculating. M is the total mass of both reactants. There's a lot of argument about this, whether or not you're supposed to add them both together. We are. We're going to add both our masses together. C is the specific heat of the solution. A lot of times, they will make a statement that says, assume the specific heat of the solution is the same as water. Because these are aqueous solutions, and most of the time, it's so close to water, we just use water's number. If it's not water, they're going to tell you what the number is. And then if, let's say my temperature initials here and my temperature finals here, we would then put in our final minus, minus initial and solve for delta T. Okay. When we do just Q equals MCAT, we're making the assumption that no heat was lost, that every single little bit of heat all the heat, whether it was absorbed or not absorbed, stayed in the container, okay? But I'm going to talk about a little problem that we need to take into account. So let's pretend this solution is exothermic. So when you touch it, it's hot because the system is giving off heat. So our temperature initial is here. Do we agree that if it was giving off heat and it's hot, wouldn't the temperature go up on the thermometer, right? Okay. 
So this is a setup for an exothermic reaction. If I were to calculate, we know my mass is a positive number and my specific heat's a positive number. In an exothermic reaction, final minus initial, uh-oh, what's the problem there? What's final minus initial here, looking at the location on the thermometer? That's positive as well. Wait a second. That's supposed to be an exothermic reaction. So there's an additional step, and I'll explain it in a second. Whenever you're using a thermometer, when you're using a thermometer, you're supposed to say negative Q is equal to the heat of the reaction. Does anyone, anyone want to take a gander why this is messed up? We're using a thermometer. What is the thermometer doing? Absorbing. When we use Q equals MCAT with coffee cup calorimetry, we're looking at the thermometer as the system. We're looking at the thermometer absorbing the heat. That is being what by the reaction? That is released by the reaction. Does everyone see that? That's why the numbers are messed up. So whenever you use a thermometer, the Q has to be changed in sign to actually reflect the heat of the reaction. Got it? All right. So this is super simple if no heat is lost. But what happens if some heat gets out? What would that do to the overall Q? It would be what? Smaller. Yeah, we'd need more heat to add to that Q to get the right Q. So we're missing some heat. Um, what you'll have to do is take the Q that the heat that goes to the thermometer and add the heat that was lost to the outside. So we have to figure out a way to calculate the heat that's lost. And the way that we do that is to solve for a capital C. This is called heat capacity of the calorimeter. What the heck is that? Every calorimeter has been calibrated to have its own heat capacity. Really crappy calorimeters like glass would have really high heat capacities, meaning it could absorb a lot of heat. So it's going to remove a lot of heat from the reaction. Good calorimeters, styrofoam, very high insulated stuff, is going to have small Cs. The unit on these Cs is joules per degree Celsius. So what would I have to multiply this by to get just the joules? the delta T. So the formula for figuring out the Q that is lost is just Q equals cat. So if I'm told heat is lost, I will be given this heat capacity. And I multiply it by delta T, and that will be how much is lost. And then I add it to that Q before I flip the signs. We're going to do an example of each. Okay. So if you're confused right now, don't worry. We'll, we'll address both of them. Let's do two examples. I want to do the easy one first. It's when 1.09 grams of sodium hydroxide are dissolved in 150 grams of water initially at 23.5 degrees Celsius. The final temperature is found to be blah, blah, blah. Calculate the heat liberated. What is that telling us? What is that telling us? It's exothermic. So we need to make sure our final delta H is exothermic, because that's what it's telling us. So they're saying, assume the specific heat of the solution is the same of water. Good. We can do that. And this is the best news. No heat is absorbed by the calorimeter. So what's the only equation we have to use? MCAT. All right. So mass total is what? Correct. We're going to add those, 151.095 grams. The specific heat is the same as water, 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. Temperature final, 25.32. Temperature initial, 23.50. So go ahead and solve for Q for me, just as is. Negative 1149 joules. Is negative 1149 joules correct for Q? Correct. 
correct. You did not get negative here. You shouldn't have. I'm asking for Q, and you can't say, I mean, that's going to be part of your point earning in the, on the AP. If you immediately report this, you're not going to get full credit. What's wrong with this? That's the amount of heat that the reaction gives off, or how much heat, technically, this is the amount of heat the thermometer absorbs. So it should be positive. Okay? I need you to make a second statement that then says this. Therefore, negative 1149 joules. You've got to pay attention to that, because as soon as we start pulling in heat capacities, if you start flipping things right away, you're going to be like, did I flip it? Do I have to flip this before I add it? What do I do? I'm confused. I don't want you flipping anything until you're totally done with all the math. OK? Are we good with that? Let's move on to now one where we have a heat capacity issue. They're mixing sodium bromide and silver nitrate. And then they make this statement. This is how you know you have to use another step. If the heat capacity of the calorimeter is 65 and the specific heat of the solution is 4.2, calculate the heat released in the reaction. So again, this is supposed to be exo at the end of the day. Um, so with this one, there's no statement that says assume no heat is lost. So we have to take that heat capacity into account. So to find the heat that goes to the thermometer, we're going to use Q equals MC delta T. And then to find the heat that is lost, what are we going to use? Q equals cat. All right, so let's do Q equals MC delta T. How many grams is our total solution? 100. Just notice there that they gave you some extraneous information. You do not need those molarities, so don't freak out if you don't use them. The specific heat of the solution is 4.20. Our delta T is, hi, our TS is 25.40, and our TI is 23.65. So what is our Q? How much heat does the thermometer absorb? Seven thirty one, seven thirty one, seven thirty five, seven hundred and thirty five joules. So now we have to figure out how much heat went the cat went to the outside. Shoom, escaped. So Q is equal to the heat capacity of the calorimeter is sixty five point zero joules per degree Celsius. So I multiply it by the delta T. What did this number? One point what? Subtract these. It's the same delta T. I just want to write down the delta T. 1.75. All right. So now we'll multiply. And what is the Q that was lost? 113? 114. I think I have selective hearing where I subtract everything by 1 before I write it down. All right. So how do I get the Q total? What do I do? Add them. So we get 849 joules. We're, we're going to, OK? That's why I don't want you to flip it first. Because if you would have done what um, he did earlier, flipped it without writing it, and then adding it here, you would have got a different answer. OK? We're looking at the absolute heat transfer right now. We're not worried about direction. Okay, so we are now going to say the delta H of the reaction is equal to negative 849 joules. Don't flip until the end. And again, it's going to be in your best interest just to do something like this on the side so the AP graders know, okay, they know what's going on. Are we good? Everyone's quiet. I can't tell. OK, let's go back and do those last three practice problems real quick. We'll see how many of you can guesstimate. I think this is where we started. 
yeah. Okay. A 100 gram sample of water at 90 degrees Celsius is added to a 100 gram sample of water at 10. The final temperature is. So this is technically an MCAT equals negative MCAT, but because it's water on both sides, and we're using the same amount, we can kind of just kind of look at it. Let's talk about it. What, what do we think? B. Why are you saying B? It is B. Yeah. We're adding the same amount, right? So it's going to be, I heard someone say the word average. It's the average of the two temperatures. So it's 100 divided by 2 because, and we can only do that because both sides have the same specific heat and we're using the same amount. All right, let's look at the next one. A 100 gram sample of water at 90 is added to 500 grams of water at 10. So the specific heat's the same on both sides, but we have a lot more at 10. So where is our temperature going to be closest to, do you think? 50? It's C. We're guessing C because we have 500 at a um, lower temperature, so we can't really average them because they're different amounts. But there's so little at um, there's so a fifth of the amount at 90 that we're going to have to be closer to a 10. For them to be 50, it would have had to been 50 degrees. It would have had to been an equal amount, so it has to be C. So in in problems where you don't have a calculator, which is the case in all your multiple choice questions, this is the kind of way you need to be solving problems sometimes. But then when you get something like this, this one's a little harder, um, and I would never expect you to do this without a calculator. You could kind of guesstimate. So we have 50 grams of water at 10 degrees Celsius, super cold. And then we have 50 grams of iron at 90 degrees Celsius, so the same amount at a higher temperature. But because the specific heat of this guy is so low, that's going to change temperature a lot. Water's not going to change temperature very much. So what do you think? See? What did they get earlier? Oh, well, they actually got 17 Hmm. earlier. Let's go ahead and just set it up and solve for it. And then we will call it a day. So we're going to do water on the left. So I'll do that the negative side. 50 grams at 10 degrees. Um, so final. We don't know final, minus 10, and specific heat is 4.18. And then we've got 50 grams of this guy, temperature final minus our temperature initial was, I lost it, 90, and its specific heat is 0.45. So someone with an 89, TI-89, go ahead and solve that. Yep, go Crisco. or anyone else who happens to get it. Some of you are fast on your 84s. So 17. So this one is a good example of one that maybe you shouldn't try to guess. 17, and that's what they got last period. They got 17 point something. Um, so I wouldn't be futzing with the whole try to guess unless you're dealing with stuff that's the same on both sides and you can do a proportion. We really can't do a proportion of this in our head because our specific heats are different and our temperature change is pretty different. All right, good work. That's it for the day.